Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Profit Minds podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch, creator of the Profit Minds Growth System, a unique blend of profit growth, productivity acceleration, and building robust business process for scale. In every episode, I interview entrepreneurs and small business owners from around the world with a unique story to tell. You can find the show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. Well, hi, everyone. Today, my guest is Kimberly Crow, founder of Entrepreneurs Rocket Fuel, an international, inspirational, motivational speaker and speaker visibility expert at Speakers Playhouse. Today, we'll be talking about how to take the stage to grow your business. Welcome, Kimberly. Hey, Steve. Very nice to see you today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to be on the show. Um, you know, and, and the question I ask every guest at the very beginning is to tell your story. Everybody's story is so unique and so different and, and how they got to be where they are and why they do what they do. It's, it's so wonderful to share. So I would love to hear your story and I sure, I'm sure our listeners would as well. Awesome. So um, I probably started much the same way as many of your listeners did in my entrepreneurship. I started at corporate. I, I was at corporate and I worked for a Fortune 1000 company. I climbed my way up the, the corporate ladder and, um, and spent, you know, 17 years there. 15 of them were good. The last two, not so much. Uh, uh, I got to the top of the corporate ladder and realized it was not even a ladder I wanted to be on. It was against yeah. the wrong wall, as they say. Exactly, exactly. So I was in golden handcuffs because I was making a lot of money as an executive director, uh, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. And um, the people that were at my level and above me were miserable. They were unhappy. Many of them were unhealthy, divorced, frustrated, and kind of not not pleasant people to be around. So uh, I thought, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, how? What's the quickest way off? And fortunately for me, I had a family of entrepreneurs and I'd had some entrepreneurial businesses on the side. So I decided to become a full-time entrepreneur. Unfortunately, when I did, I went to my friends and family and said, what do you think I should do? And they said, well, you were so good at corporate. Why don't you do that? What you did at corporate. And I was like, oh, great idea. So I built a whole business around what I was good at doing. And uh, my goal was to build it to a million dollars. I did that successfully in about 18 months. I built it to a, over a million dollars in revenue, but then I was miserable and I realized, yeah, wait, wait, wait. So you, you quit your miserable job and then in 18 months made a million dollars and, and we're still miserable. So what I ended up doing is building a business around a job and skill set that I didn't want to do anymore. I was good at it, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. I knew I was supposed to be doing other things. That was not the only thing in my skill set. And, and I, I was really, really unhappy. I thought not only was I in golden handcuffs, now I was in a golden jail cell because I had contracts and clients and employees and people who counted on me for paychecks. And I was responsible for delivering what this business had promised. And I was very, very unhappy. And so I climbed to the top of a mountain, like climbed to a mountaintop to see if I could find the answer. And lo and behold, it was not up there. But I'm not just an entrepreneur. I'm also a mom, a parent, as many of your listeners probably are. And when I got back home defeated, my son met me at the front door and said, Mom, I've got a problem. And I thought, great, somebody else's problem to focus on for a change. This is wonderful, right? So I said, what's your problem? And he said, well, I'm at the wrong age. I'm 15 and a half. And that means I'm too young to get a summer job this summer. And I'm too old to go back to summer camp because I'm 15 and a half. And that's boring and stupid now. So I said, I totally get it, sweetie. But you know what you're never too young or too old to do is be an entrepreneur. So why not for fun this summer, we can just create an entrepreneurship around what you love doing. Something just for fun. And his guys got really big and he said, can we do that? And I know he was thinking about the money. And I know I was thinking about what would good, look good on a college application. But between the two of us, we decided that we would start a business that was just something for fun. And we put in all, everything that he was good at into Google. 
Uh, he loved being on stage. He was good at impromptu speaking. He read stories to kids at the local um, after school program and at the library. And he loved doing that. And when we put it all in, out pops the idea of why not be an audiobook narrator? And he got super excited and said, can we do that? And I said, sure, why not? Seems, seems like a reasonable at home business to create. And we did. And we had so much fun, Steve. We had so much fun that we actually got more business than we could handle. Friends and family were giving us their books to read. People that we didn't even know who heard about us were giving books to read. And we got more business than we could fulfill ourselves in the summer. So we ended up starting to teach other people how to be an audiobook narrator. Now, Stephen, I'd only been an audiobook narrator for about three months. I was no expert, but I knew what I knew up until this point. And I realized that even though it wasn't something I've been doing for 17 years, it was something that I could teach other people to do. And so I started teaching online about how to become an audiobook narrator and voiceover artist. And I had so much fun. And I thought, you know what? This is the secret sauce. It's really not about what you're good at or what you're trained to do. It's about what you love doing. And a couple of years later, I found this amazing quote from Howard Thurman that said, Howard Thurman was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mentor. And he said, do not ask the world what it needs. Ask you what lights you up. Because what the world needs are more people who are lit up. Wow. That's great. So, so talk to me about the Speaker's Playhouse and, and your motivational speaking things. Absolutely. So I switched from doing a job job and providing a, a business service to really helping people find what their passion is and what they have fun doing and moving that along on the path toward monetization. I really believe that you, everybody has magic inside them. They're, we're all brought to this planet for a reason with the gifts that we have. And if we do what we love, then we're on task. Then we're doing what our purpose is here to do because that's the guiding principle behind it. Are you having fun? Are you loving doing it? And if you are, fabulous, you're on the right track. So I really help people find businesses that they love doing and encouraging them to share that by speaking on other people's stages. I know that not a lot of bootstrapping entrepreneurs have a lot of money to be able to advertise or, you know, print out flyers or posters or whatever, but stages and speaking on other people's podcasts, radio shows, TV shows, web summits, webinars, and real live in-person stages gives you the opportunity to share your goodness with a larger audience. And when people get to know you and know who you are and see you all lit up, they're naturally magnetically attracted to you. And for me, that's how I built my list. I built a, a tribe of loyal, raving fans. I have over 50,000 people on my list and many more times that followers on social media. And I absolutely love what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that that's such a great story because, you know, so many small, you know, so many small business owners, they get into, get into what they do, you know, because they're passionate about what they do. Now, of course, they, they have challenges running their business and that's what I help sure. them with. But, but, you know, it's so important. I, I've heard so many people say, you know, I love what I do so much that I don't call it work. Yes, you're absolutely right. But I would I would say that many of your audience, if they are living their passion, if they are working in a field that they truly, truly love, they're the exception to the rule. But one of the things that happens when people do what they love and they just spend their time in that is that they don't realize that a business is about 50 percent sales, especially in the beginning. Sometimes it's as, it's a, as much as 70 More than that. percent yeah. sales, right? 70 percent sales. And no matter how long you'll do it, you do have a role in sales and marketing in some capacity. Uh, and a lot of people are like, wait a minute, I started this business to coach. I started this business to help people. I started this business to do healings, um, but they didn't want to sell. And so or even, of, even to be a plumber, right? Whatever it is, right? You still sure. have to sell yourself. Sure. Yeah. You have to get out there and you can either buy an opportunity to promote yourself. And if you do, you get what? 10 words on a Facebook ad that says how great you are and hope people grab that. 
Or you can get on somebody else's stage and have a conversation with them or with the audience and share a little bit about your personality and who you are and how you show up in the world. People are magnetically attracted to who you are. And that is an easy way to promote your programs, products, or services because you just show up authentically. Don't try to be anybody else for several reasons. First of all, everybody else is taken. And secondly, <laughs> if you show up as, as somebody else, then they're buying somebody else. And when you go to deliver, they're not going to get what they expected. So you really want to make sure that you show up as your authentic self, be relaxed and comfortable on stage, and just share authentically what you love. Yeah, you know, that that sounds great, Kimberly. But I can imagine a bunch of my listeners saying, yeah, but I'm not a natural on stage. I, I mean, how, how do I how do I get started? Awesome. So um, first of all, really, a podcast is just a conversation with another human being. You and I are having a conversation right now, right? Yeah. So if you're capable of having conversations, then you're capable of getting on podcasts. The next step is where do I find them? And we have lots of resources for you for that. We'll put some notes in the show notes on how you can get on other people's stages. Um, but there's actually, I'd love to talk about four different types of stages you can get on and how to profit from each one. Does that sound good? Uh, that that sounds that sounds great. Let's let's go there. Awesome. So the first type is a pretty obvious one for entrepreneurs. It's the speak to sell stage where you would get on a stage and talk about your programs, products, or services. Ideally, you're pouring into the audience and sharing a little bit about your knowledge, skills, and abilities and giving them something that they can take away as a learning, whether they do business with you or not, that they're made to be better off after that. And then secondly, after that, we have an opportunity to be able to do um, to, to make them an offer for a program, product, or service that they need to uh, purchase in order to do business with you. And that's stage number one is speak to sell. The way to profit from that one is to make sure that you have a proper call to action so that they can take the natural next step of doing business with you. Now, that might be to buy your stuff, but it might also be, hey, check out my website or grab my freebie or let's get on a phone call together and chat. Yeah, no, that's that that's that's really that's a really great place to start. Um, that what what what's the best speak to sell stage? Is is that a podcast or? Couldn't really be anything. I personally love to speak in person for speak to sell, but every stage that you get on is a potential speak to sell stage. For example, this uh, podcast might be an opportunity for people to check out my website. Or it might be an opportunity for people to connect with me one-on-one -on -one or uh, check out my YouTube channel or something like that. So on any podcast that you speak on, you can absolutely bring them to the next natural step to learn more about your programs, products, or services. Cool. So what's stage number two? Stage number two is really for speaker speakers, people who want to speak and get paid to do it. It's called the paid speaking gig. That means that you actually get paid for sharing your juicy goodness on the stage. So that might be an opportunity to do a keynote in front of a corporation, or it might be teaching a class. I've done a lot of paid speaking opportunities, including being a, an equestrian polo announcer. I have done audiobooks where I've gotten paid to speak. I've done uh, classes where I've taught uh, a skill. I've done classes where I've taught at corporations that they paid me to teach on total quality management. So a very specific skill to a group that really needed that, that information. So you can get paid to speak in a variety of different ways. The way to profit from that one is make sure that you get paid before you actually speak because you can't repossess your talk, right? So mm. you got to make sure that you get paid before you speak. On a traditional keynote, you'll sign a contract and that contract should say that you get 50% of your fee up front to reserve the day for them. And then 50% at the end of, or before you speak at the anywhere before you actually get on the microphone. That might be a week before, it might be a day before, it might be the day of, it might be a few minutes before. And the way to maximize that one is make sure that you have a way to collect payment on that final day. If you don't, some people will get on the stage and deliver their content. That's perfectly fine. But then you have no way to repossess your talk and you just built a new business for yourself that you'll have to work with Stephen on to make sure that it's profitable. <laughs> it's called collections and it's not so fun. It's not fun. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so again, what's the best way to get started doing that kind of thing? Ah, well, actually stages create stages. So my favorite way to get on stage is just by meeting somebody who has a podcast and have a conversation with them about do, being a, a guest on their podcast. That's probably the simplest and easiest way. I used to teach the simplest and easiest way was to do a Facebook Live, but I found that most people are pretty intimidated by that. You don't need anybody's permission to do Facebook Live. You just go live on your own Facebook account and basically you've created a show. The way you do that is just decide. You decide that every week, maybe Wednesdays at one or Tuesdays at two or Thursdays at three, you're going to go live every week at the same time and make sure that you have a regularity to it. Once you have a regularity to it, you really do have a show yeah. and you don't need anybody's permission to do it. And, and and what about getting paid to speak? I mean, that, that, that seems to me, you know, cause I've, I've toyed with that idea myself and, and, you know, getting, you know, getting somebody to pay me to speak, um, of course, I've given courses, so I suppose that's a some sense a, a paid paid to 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 speak. Um, anytime but, you've been, yep, anytime you've been paid before you spoke, that is a paid speaking gig. Huh, so if you're okay. a fourth grade teacher, that's a paid speaking gig. But Steve, I I think that you're referring to like keynoting, and there right. are keynotes that um, we actually have. I teach a, a whole session on how to become a keynote speaker and book a five thousand dollar billable bookable billable five thousand dollar keynote talk. Um, we actually help you build it in a weekend, and it's really really fun. Um, but that. That is, there are opportunities out there to speak to corporations, associations, colleges, universities, and even on cruise ships that will pay for speakers to be able to present their material. Huh. Never thought about speaking on a cruise ship before. I don't know you if I'm, actually, I don't, I don't, know, I, I don't really know if I'm funny enough for that. <laughs> well, you don't necessarily have to be a comedian. Actually, cruise ships sometimes hire people to be able to teach things like, for example, how to connect with your millennial children and your Gen Z grandchildren, right? Hmm. That would be a great little talk that you could give. And at the end of that, you could talk a little bit about something that you offer, you know, and have, uh, you know, maybe uh, teach them a class on how to use Zoom or something like that, and then charge for that. So there's a lot of opportunities to be able to speak on cruise ships. You just have to get a little bit creative yeah. and have something that would be appropriate to that particular audience. Interesting. All right. So now, now we're to stage number three. What's that? Stage number three is an authority stage. Stage number three is one that uh, oftentimes people will say, is that a TEDx stage? And yes, TEDx is an authority stage. An authority stage is any stage that gives you authority just by the very being of on it. So if you are on TEDx, you become an authority on that particular subject. Uh, you have to cross through a gate to get on an authority stage. So, for example, if you were interviewed on Oprah or if you were entered in, if interviewed on a, a talk show, right, on ABC, CBS, NBC, one of the major networks, you would be an authority just by the very being of on it uh, when you were on that show. And the way to maximize that one is kind of interesting. You can profit from that one, not necessarily by doing a speak to sell because you might not be able to pitch your program, product or service. You might not get paid to speak on one of those stages. In fact, you can do neither on a TEDx stage. All you can do on TEDx is have an idea worth sharing. But what you can do is get it out everywhere, publish it everywhere, put that icon at everywhere, put it on your LinkedIn profile, your website, put it on your social media and put it down on your signature line in your emails for a couple of months. The way to maximize that one is to make sure everybody can see it, comment on it, watch it, share it, like it, and make sure it goes viral. Going viral by definition is just that it gets outside of your reach. So if you have a list of 2,000 people and it's watched by 6,000 people, officially, it's gone viral. Hmm. Cool. So, so again, how, how do you, how do you look for authority stages then? How do you, how do you get yourself positioned to be on an authority stage? Well, that's a great question. And the answer is it depends. If you're going on Oprah, you probably have to have somebody pitch for you, right? If yep. you're going on TEDx, really, you just apply. There are, uh, you would search the internet for TEDx stages. There's not really a 
a list out there from, that TEDx provides because they don't want you just blanket up, uh, applying to a whole bunch of them all at once. But there are resources out there that have a list of different TEDx's that you can apply to. You want to apply to one that has a theme that you're, look, you're looking to speak on. Maybe it's grief. Uh, maybe it's family. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's profit. And you would apply to a stage that was in that realm. And then when you get accepted on that stage, you go through a process in order to qualify to speak on that stage. They have to review your talk. Uh, for me, I actually went through quite a few renditions of it. I had two different coaches that I worked with. Um, we have performance coaches and then tech coaches, uh, the, the ones that were actually working on the speech itself. And it was really a, a huge process. You just go through it one step at a time. It's sort of like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. Mm. Not that I prefer elephant. Yeah, no, but it's kind of tough. Um, <laughs> awesome. Are you ready for stage so, number four? Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what's stage number four? Stage number four is a, a rehearsal stage. So rehearsal stages are super important. And I've been on over 5,000 stages. My best talk ever is my next one because you can always get better. This talk that I gave today is actually the first time I ever gave it was on another podcast. I've probably given this somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 times at this point, but this particular talk, it just needs practice and it gets better theoretically every time you give it. Sometimes this is a 20 minute talk, sometimes it's a 90 minute talk, sometimes it's a five minute talk. And every time you give it, you give it a little bit differently and improve along the way. The way to maximize that one and profit from that one is actually by getting feedback. Now, my feedback is actually coming from you right now while we're talking, but also after I, this podcast is published, I can go back into the comments section and see what comments were made. You know, if they say, well, I wish she wasn't quite clear about this point, or I'm not sure what she meant by a TEDx stage or a variety of different things. And then the next time I give the talk, I can give it a little differently. I can improve upon it every single time. So every stage that you get, perhaps with the exception of your TEDx stage, is really the potential for a rehearsal stage. Life is just a series of rehearsals. We're all here to play for fun. And my favorite stages, as we talked in the green room, my favorite stages are live stages. So for whatever happens, happens. I don't encourage you to have a rehearsal stage be any of these categories. Don't make it a video that you record of yourself. Your, two, your criticism and your feedback from yourself is really too judgmental. The second one is your bathroom mirror. And the third one is in front of your pets or your children. None of those can give you appropriate feedback for what you need. So you want to be sure that you're giving it in front of an audience that can give you proper feedback. And that's the way to profit from that stage. Yeah. No, that's that's really good. You know, I'm, I'm part of a, 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 a group called Video Socials. Yes. And um, we do every week we meet as a as a group. And everybody does a three minute video and then everybody else gives feedback. And it's been amazing how much better I am in yes. giving my videos now than I was two years ago when I first started doing it. Steve, you're absolutely right. That is absolutely key for improving as a public speaker. And most of your audience has already been a public speaker. The definition of it is speaking to two or more people at the same time. So many of you already have. In fact, some of your audience probably has even gone to big stages. For example, if you've ever read a religious text in front of your religious organization, if you read from the Bible or the Quran, uh, and you read to the the or the any of the biblical texts, uh, if you've read in front of a large audience, you could have say, "I've spoken in front of large audiences." So many of you have already done it, and none of you have died from doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least not that we know of. <laughs> Nobody's no, ever died on my stage so, and I'm not starting now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so how do you, what do you recommend that people get over the fear of getting in front of people? Great question. So if you're feeling that feeling in your stomach where it's sort of like doing loop-de-loops or your ears are ringing or your head is spinning or you're, you're maybe not able to focus clearly, those are all signs of nervousness, right? And you can't really just say, I'm not nervous. I can get on stage. Maybe your breathing is very rapid. And people will tell you, imagine people in their underwear or take deep breathing exercises. Well, those don't really work because your body is actually having a physical response and just ignoring it doesn't work. So what I recommend is using your mind to actually 
change the parameters of what you're feeling. So instead of saying, I'm not feeling any of that, instead of saying, I'm feeling nervous to get on stage, those feelings that you're feeling are also the same feelings as are in excitement. So instead of saying, I'm nervous to get on stage, you can say, I'm excited to get on stage because then your ears are ringing and your head is spinning and your breathing is faster and your tummy is doing flips and you're experiencing the same things. But chemically in your brain, it doesn't know the difference between nervousness and excitement. So the next time you're going to get on a stage, I encourage you to say, I'm excited to get on this stage. Wow, that's a great perspective. You know, I've, I've been a performer for well a very long time uh and and uh you know i always find myself a little bit nervous or excited um before i go on and and the thing that happens to me is that you know i'm well enough rehearsed by the time i actually get on stage that you know the nervousness or the excitement only really lasts for you know a moment or two a few seconds. And once I'm going, it's okay. But I never heard anybody talk about, you know, reframing that, that physiological function as excitement instead of nervousness. That, that's really great. Chemically, it's exactly the same. So as you get onto it, and you will hear me when you come with, if you come to see any of my regular shows, you'll, you'll, I say it by reflex now, just about every time I'm excited, we're getting together today, right? And, and the opportunity to get better at speaking really just happens with speaking. It's the, it's immersion therapy. The more you speak, the better more relaxed you are at it. Now, Stephen, you talk about memorizing or, or practice or rehearsal. All of that is really, really good. In fact, it's one of the stages I talk about. But oftentimes when you are speaking to another person, you, you aren't, you're not delivering a prepared speech. The only prepared speech I've really given in the last thousand talks was my TEDx. That was the only fully prepared, rehearsed, scripted out, sure. word for word talk I've really given. All the rest of them have been just coming from talks I've given before, and it expands or contracts a little bit based on our timing. Yeah, but but it is it is good to think about the kinds of things that you want to cluster together. Absolutely. If you're, if you're trying to make a point, like Absolutely. you've delivered this speech about the the four stages. Uh, a number of times, right? This this talk, right? And and each time you do it, as you as you pointed out, right? There's there's a you know a slight nuance to the way you describe each of the stages. And and today you talked about how you profit from each of those stages. Uh, so that was maybe something that was a little bit different from what might be standard. Um, so so I think yeah, you you're you're right. It's it's a conversation, and it's almost always that's most of the time when you're speaking is it just a conversation. Uh, Absolutely. but, but the rehearsal stage, I think, as you, as you pointed out that, that fourth stage, a really important way, uh, to, to make sure that you, that you cluster your ideas together and, and, uh, make it coherent. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's just a matter, as I say, of immersion therapy, the more you do it, the more relaxed you become. Every time is going to be a little bit different and that's okay. And the more you do it, you realize you didn't die from doing it. You just get out and do it again. And it becomes easier and easier with exposure. Yeah. So I understand you have a free gift for our listeners. Yes. Um, I would love to share that. Uh, one of the things that's difficult for newer entrepreneurs is, is to build that, that following, build that, that group of loyal raving fans, the people that subscribe to your email list or your newsletter. So I have a free gift for folks. It's how to speak to build your list. And they can grab that. And it's a simple checklist that they can follow to figure out the best ways for them to speak to build their list. That's great. And we'll make sure that, that that link is in the show notes. And Kimberly, if, if people wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach out? Awesome. I have a weekly show. It's called Speaker's Playhouse. and I'm Which is lots of fun, by the way. It's lots of fun. My motto is, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. So, um, and believe it or not, I implement that in all kinds of areas in my life. People are like taxes and I'm like, yep. So it's, there's all kinds of ways to implement that, but come to Speaker's Playhouse. It's, it's free. It's every single week, except between the Christmas and New Year's. Um, but every other week we, we are live, even on American Thanksgiving. It's every Thursday from 1030 AM to noon. And you can just go to speakersplayhouse.com or we'll put the link in the chat for you guys to be able to check that out. 
Great. Thanks so much. You know, and that concludes our show for today. Thanks so much to my guest, Kimberly Crow, the founder of Entrepreneurs Rocket Fuel and the international inspirational, motivational speaker and speaker visibility expert at Speakers Playhouse. I hope you learned something about speaking to grow your business. I know I did. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Profit Minds podcast. This is your host, Dr. Stephen Kirch. Please visit www.profitminds.net for other episodes or to contact me. Thank you for your positive feedback, comments, questions, and for sharing this show with others. Thanks for listening. Have a grateful day.